Good evening, welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. Paul Caritas. This is the third and last part of my discussion on um, how Hellenistic or Greek alchemy, uh, sorry, Hellenistic and Greek philosophy influenced Western alchemy. So the full grafting of Hellenistic philosophy onto the technical and chemical operative prescriptions of the proto-alchemical period in Egypt is clearly discernible in the work of the Gnostic Zosimus, who tended to view alchemy as a soteriological method whereby nature as a whole could be transformed. In his commentary entitled On Virtue, of which only fragments have survived, Zosimus describes a series of dreamlike visions and accompanying interpretations in which he implicitly alludes to the idea that the intangible principle of zestfulness, colour, character, distinctiveness and insolment, that is the pnevma or spirit, can be separated from its corporeal prison through ordinary evaporational processes like sublimation and distillation. His clever use of metaphor to draw parallels between base metals and human beings, between the distillation apparatus and temples and altars, and between the liberation of the soul spirit from the human body and the transformation of the volatile substance in base metals is intentional and draws attention to corresponding processes of creation reflected in the divine mind or the one. Hence, a secondary dream transcribed in visions involving the ritual torture, punishment, which is kolossis in Greek, and death of a horde of men inside an alchemical flask can be equated with the liberation of pnevmata, so many souls, from their restrictive matrix through heat and the application of corrosives, their purification with rudimentary transformation into a nobler form, and the resurrection or reanimation of their mutilated bodies, the crystallization of a new form. Zosimus first discusses the alchemical allegory uh, in the context of individual reagents before augmenting his parameters to include created nature as a whole. He postulates that success in transmutation is entirely contingent on the individual alchemist, who, in seeking success, must permit for nature, physis, to be forced to the investigation, ekthlivomeni prostinzetisin, by regressing to a primordial state of confusion and suffering, talena, where her instinctual reaction will be to assume variant intermediary states of being until she wafts closer and closer to death. Only through this arduous trajectory can she ever hope to multiply her conscious and become more pneumatic. According to Zosimus, the manipulation of the invigorating life principle or the pnevma and its reintegration with the lifeless physical base through the practical techniques resulted in genuine transmutation. Several sections in the 13 Apostles of Zosimus's authentic memoirs deal with distillation equipment in a pneumatic uh, capacity. He describes several apparatuses intended for sublimation, numerous multi-piped alembics fashioned from glass and fitted with clay or terracotta stems that were used for either distillation or the fixation of mercury, and a sophisticated cylinder-like vessel called a gerotakis. As an implement of sublimation, the last of these was especially significant because it facilitated changes in coloration and properties that were no doubt construed as a genuine recombination of the pnevma with the body. Uh, the Kerotakis um, tower was a closed vessel comprised of three cubicles, a lower compartment in which material to be sublimed was placed, a perforated plate near the top of the vessel on which a lead of metal or ore was placed, and a hemispheric cap which collected the vapours. Sublimation was performed by fixing a substance, usually arsenic, sulphide, mercury, or sulphur, on the lowermost compartment, directly above a burning furnace, and letting the vaporous fumes react with the metal or ore resting on the middle of the plate. Once the fumes reached the hemispherical lid on the top, they would condense into a liquid and sluice their way back to the compartment containing the liquefied substance. Eventually, the sublimate would infuse itself into the metallic base, rendering modifications to the external uh, colours and patterns that were perceived by Zosimus to be fundamental changes in the structure of matter. In retrospect, the imitative arts have a very long and illustrious history in Western civilization. Irrespective of their innate gravitation towards a particular craft, all artists were primarily interested in the amalgamation of synthetically fabricated features that either rivaled that of their natural prototype or excelled over it. For Plato, Plotinus and the Neoplatonists, there was an immaterial world of forms, a realm of being that stood apart from and underpinned the sphere of created nature or becoming. The fundamental principles of time and space separated these two worlds. Time set forth the will of change, and change was understood to mean an adherence to the cycles of birth 
growth and death which enabled everything natural to strive for perfection to seek its ultimate form. Assuming the role of a miniature demiurge, an artist could replicate natural proce uh, processes through mimesis. Often the products themselves would be impressive and aesthetically pleasing, yet they lacked the intrinsic principle of movement and the innate qualities that characterize their prototypes. An example par excellence of the counterfeiting of natural products like gold and silver, as well as natural dyes and precious stones, pervades the technical prescriptions of the late in the 10th and the Stockholm papyri, both of which represent a mechanistic or exoteric proto-alchemy. Later, when the alchemical writings fused with the philosophical musings of the Greeks and above all the nature philosophy of Aristotle, the Hermetic art reorientated itself in the Alexandrine world as a techni that could modify the underlying structure of matter and hence influence the teleology. By the time Zosimus of Panopolis uh, started writing his 28 volume corpus which encompassed his own innovative insights um, and the earlier texts, Alchemy was no longer just a perfective and chemical operation seeking to create the ultimate materia, so the worldly panacea or gold. It was a jewel art imbued with a redemptive and mystical soteriological aspect in which the human soul, also prima materia, forged a new personality for the alchemist and in doing so mirrored the torture of matter in the Alembic as it was purified, cleansed and refined through repeated cycles of solve et coagula, which means to uh, break and then divide and then rejoin. One could argue that this, a techni that sought to perfect the embryo forms in the womb of the earth by causing them to ripen prematurely, to spiritualize the human body and spur an embodiment of the spirit, most typical of illumination, constituted the last of a series of stages in the evolution of ancient alchemy that was inherited by the Arabs and the Christian West. Alongside medicine, alchemy claimed an illustrious and exalted place in the hierarchy of ancient techni by claiming to recapitulate the processes of creation in whole and down to the last bit of detail. The production of stones, metals, substances, powerful elixirs, and even human life itself, actions that had originally stemmed from divine cogitation, were now viable and seduced people from all areas of intellectual inquiry, as well as those who styled themselves alchemists. Of course, none of it would have been possible had alchemy not borrowed its authoritative looking glass from Greek philosophy. And that concludes today's lesson on uh, Hellenistic philosophy and how it influenced Western alchemy. I will see you next time for something different. See you soon.